How are you doing, sir? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. Listen, it's an honor, and I thank you very much for this、uh, opportunity to speak to you.、Uh, My pleasure. You know, I know these are hard times and these are rough times, but you know you're doing what you can. I guess the the people in the in the political department are doing what they can and taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with DJ Wiz and the Wizology Show and all the people around the world. It's a it's a real honor, and I thank you for that. No,、First、thank you very much, and I want to thank you for、uh, everything you're doing. You know, getting the the, the message out to the people.、Uh, thank you. You know, you're bringing it right to the the people, and that's the most important thing. Yeah,、uh, yeah.、Uh, I think you know, as you you know, address the people are the most important thing, at least to me, because without、right. them we can't survive.、Um, I'm going to speak to you today from a perspective of an everyday person. Uh, I, I said this. I've talked to others in your political department.、Uh, the main fact is that I feel like political、uh, governments or people in the in the in the government they talk about us, they make decisions for us, but I think they lack talking to us. Right, And right.、Um, this is this is what we want to get through today.、Uh, okay, we'll first start with. Yeah, who you are? I mean, you're a liberal critic for in infrastructure, energy labor, energy labor, economical development.、Uh, you know, but many people are now going to be unemployed through COVID nineteen, and what's at stake?、Uh, you know, the guy who pays the rent, the lady who has to pay for her kids in her grocery stores, and and you know, has Ontario done enough for laborers? Well. You know, if you look at、um, if you look at the comparison between like the federal government and the provincial government, so what Canada has done and what the province has done, I have to be honest.、Um, you know, the the provincial government has not done a lot besides giving、uh, parents two hundred dollars for、uh, childcare.、Uh, everything、mm -hmm. else has come from、uh, from the federal government. You know, the uh, the uh, serve money for anyone who's been unemployed or displaced. You know the the three thousand dollars a month. That's you know Justin Trudeau's federal government. If you talk 2000, about、uh, 2000, you know if 2000. you talk about、um, even businesses going out of business, like that's all being federal money, right? And you、right. see a lot of money coming from Ottawa, rightfully so. But I think the provincial government needs to step up a little bit and start to like put in a little bit more backup、uh, because you have to remember the provincial budget is like a hundred and sixty billion dollars. Plus, the federal government before COVID is like two hundred and you know sixty billion. So you know there's there's not a huge dis, you know difference uh, you know uh, in uh, in amount. You know obviously forty percent difference. But you、yeah. know the province of Ontario only has to focus on Ontario. Canada has to look after the entire country. So our provincial government needs to step up and do a bit more to help people. And we're going to see those numbers, those unemployment numbers, jump. And every single province today was announced. Had an increase in jobs in May, except Ontario. So we're seeing the worst of COVID nineteen. Yeah, like wow, we're in for a, we're in for a tough ride ahead. Then Ontario is、yeah. in for a tough. Ride. You know, people you know, don't realize that.、Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize like you know what the long term effects are going to look like because we we don't really know for sure. But I can tell you, you know, restaurants, you know,、um, movie theaters. Uh, you know, clubs. If you go to the clubs, if you go down even a little bar、yeah. down in the west, wherever you go, all of those social interactions that we've all been part of, traveling, you know, tourism, all of that stuff is going to be affected by this. And you know, tourism, for example, in Ontario, is the number one employer of young people.、Mm -hmm. You know, shopping malls. What do you think is going to happen to the Eaton Center? You know, they hire ten thousand plus people. You know, those places are are shut down right now, and I don't see、uh, in the next、uh, you know month or two those those kind of businesses opening up. So there's going to be a lot of、uh, disruption, you know, in Ontario, in, in Canada, and around the world. I was surprised to see today that、uh, Jamaica is opening up for tourism at the end of the month. They're the first.、Yeah. Uh, I was shocked to see that. Yeah, we're we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that because that is that is some shocking shocking revelations of what's going on here. Uh, to stick with our city, right? Over the course of the last month or two, the city streets have been pretty much empty. Correct? Right. Like right. everybody's been home. How come construction 
on the roads weren't at a higher level of being completed and, and fixed up. And now you go on the roads, here's construction to, things are opening up, here's construction to block traffic and stuff. What happened there? Yeah, I think at the beginning, people really didn't understand how this thing spread between people, right? So to shut down everything completely was the first response. And then they mm -hmm. started going into a second phase and third phase where they started to ease restrictions. So, you know, two and a half months ago, it was really difficult to determine, you know, could I get COVID by standing 10 feet from you, 20 feet? You know, uh, what was the transmission like? Our coworkers who are working on, uh, you know, projects downtown on roads, you know, in apartment buildings, construction, you know, could it spread easily? So I think there was a lot of confusion. Uh, uh, in fairness, they did move into a second phase where they've started to allow some construction to be built. Um, and as long as precautions are, are in place. So I, I hear what you're saying. When no one was on the streets for a, a month and a half, it would have been the perfect time to get all the construction done. You're, you're you right. You think so? Um, but I just think, I don't think we knew too much at that point, right? People didn't know what right. was going on. So I think there was a lot of fear and we didn't know the extent of, uh, you know, the damage that COVID-19 would actually do in our society, both from an economic standpoint, but also from a personal health standpoint. Okay. Because, I mean, Eglinton is not getting finished for now. The Eglinton, Eglinton line is ridiculous. And it's been for years, Mr. Yeah, Kuto, yeah. years. And, and think about the displacement of all those businesses, especially a lot of black businesses in the West End, in Eglinton West, right? Like, this is where I'm there, doing it's it. Like, the, everything's torn up. But remember that I grew up in Fleming and Park. I represent Flem Flemo, right? So yeah. that whole line goes through my community. So I right. can see that disruption on a daily basis. And, you know, I get phone calls. It's, tr you know, cause traffic. And, um, you know, those are the growing pains of a city, uh, you know, moving to the next level, building transit in the proper way. But, um, you know, I lived in South Korea for a couple of years. Yeah. And I saw them build a city in a year. And so Eglinton I don't understand Taylor sometimes Phoenix. why it takes us so long here in Toronto to do so, these things. So, so who's to blame? Who do we look at when you see Eglinton and these Black-owned business, Italian-owned businesses, anybody owning a business along the Eglinton is disrupted mm -hmm. because people can't walk, people can't drive. Well, if they do drive, it's roadblock of traffic. Transit goes through there. Right, right. These people depend on these businesses to live. Who do we contact? Who do we call? You've gotten the calls. But yeah, so I'm the MPP, so I get calls in my area. But, um, you know, I don't know how much those phone calls are going to make a difference, to be honest, because there's a schedule to, to build that infrastructure. It's in place, and the contracts have been signed, and the timelines have been agreed to. So besides, you know, businesses looking for local solutions, maybe opening up an extra, you know, pathway to get to the street or you know, slowing down something maybe on a Saturday to encourage more business, those types of little changes could happen. So, you know, picking up the phone to call your MPP or city councilor, you know, locally perhaps could make a difference, but the overall big picture, those timelines are locked in for a long time. I'll tell you this right now, if those businesses, and it's tough for those businesses, but if those businesses can survive, especially with COVID-19, you know, the transit is going to, uh, is going to bring in so much more business into those areas, and you'll see a lot, a lot more vertical grow in the on the street. And hopefully, but, uh, hopefully, if uh, if those businesses do survive, they can reap the benefit that, of that pain. That's the deal. That's the, the problem, though. They some of them cannot survive. What's right. going to take place there? These these people have been there for twenty, thirty years, and under construction for the last ten to 12, right. they're not surviving. You guys, yeah. like the, the government is looking at if they survive. No, they're not surviving. So Where do they the, turn? So you bring up a good point because one of the things that uh, government has done a bad job, and it's not just, you know, the Doug Ford government or liberal government or the NDP government before that, you know, the investment into, into infrastructure, um, you, know, um, you know, I'm in my 40s now. And the mm -hmm. only thing that I've ever seen built in this, uh, this, this city oh, in, um, over the course of my lifetime has been the, 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 the express to the airport 
and uh, and the and the young extension. That's it. Yeah, Whereas they did Hello that far. Like, one day, just Google, just Google the map of South Korea's subway in Seoul. Just Google it. Just just look at the transit and what they've been able to do, and other countries are able to do so quickly. Um, we have no excuse. We've got to do better, and we've got to do better planning. But we've also got to be we've got to be bold as a city and get things done quickly, efficiently, yeah. and uh, and and expand. Because I'll tell you, man, it's tough driving on the streets in this city because of the traffic. And you know what it's like when you jump on the subway; it's unpredictable. Hundred percent. Listen, the handling of of COVID nineteen from the Ford government and even the opposition NDP. You're looking from the outside in now. Right, right. Right. Do you feel that there were some cracks? There's a lot of cracks in there of their handling that you could have done or the Liberal Party could have done better? So one of the things that Doug Ford did was he cut inspections in these long-term care homes. He cut money from uh, the healthcare sector and he cut money from public health. People don't realize that public health you know, not many people realize that public health deals with the prevention, you know, the prevention of, you know, by sharing good, you know, health literacy, I can, mm -hmm. you know, I can, like, for example, simple thing, like, you know, they say don't take Tylenol or Advil if you drink alcohol because it destroys your liver. It amplifies it, right? That's, that's right. health literacy. That's just like health literacy. If you know it, you know it. A lot of people don't know that. But I mean, that's preventative health and public health can get out there, you know, when it comes to sexual health and say, you know, if you're going to do this, you should, you know, you should use a condom. You should use, you know, protection. That's public yeah. health. That's good public health. Like, you remember the organization CAP, the, you know, the, uh, you, you know, CAP, the, the one, it's an organization that works on uh, preventing uh, HIV spread within the black community. Okay. okay. Like, okay. that's good public health. You've got to fund that kind of stuff, right? You got to mm -hmm. make sure you invest in those areas. So Doug Ford cut money, a billion dollars from public, from, from public health, cut the inspections of those homes, you know, and you can't expect not to see what we're seeing in, in these long-term care facilities uh, when you've cut all the inspection. You have to inspect these places. So we wouldn't have made those cuts. I don't, the NDP wouldn't have made those cuts. But I know the okay. Liberals, we wouldn't have made those cuts, but... The Doug Ford government made those cuts. And here's the crazy thing about it. We don't, there's been so much cuts into after school programs, education, OSA, you know, into investment into jobs and, you know, and training. We don't know, like, it takes a crisis to show where the cracks are. You know, it takes a real crisis. And COVID just showed, you know, in the health long term care facilities where the cracks were, where the deficiencies in the system. Um, it's yeah. going to take a crisis to reveal these other shortfalls within the government. Um, and if you don't see a crisis, what you start to see is 10 years later, you start to see the effects of it. And a good example of that was Mike Harris. He cut all these, these programs to, 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 you know, in the Jane and Finch community and Fleming and Park. They, they cut all, my, all the programs when I was a kid. And then you right. saw 10 years later, what did you see? Exactly go up to the year of the gun. Gun violence just went like this because the kids mm -hmm. are not engaged. They're not provided with opportunity. And I'll tell you, if it, you know if a kid is not given opportunity, they'll find opportunity themselves. 100. That's you, it, you know, right? that, 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 that brings me to a good point of investment. You know, 1.5 million was recently, they said, invested in to help black community in Ontario recover from COVID-19. What's this all about? Where's that money? What, so, where, like, so that? That, it's a bit of a that's a bit of a of a, of a like that's a bit of a fraud that statement because the 1.5 million was for a youth council, and from what I hear, it's for a youth council for all youth, which is good, but I don't know how it's money for the black community during COVID-19. Remember, we were funding for youth programs with the Black Youth Action Plan. It was a 47 million dollar initiative just aimed at black kids in, in Windsor, Hamilton, GTA, Ottawa. That's it. And it focused right. on black. And then, then we also had, you know, money invested for racialized groups and black kids for health, uh, mental health and that kind of stuff. Doug Ford has made these cuts. So that actual youth council that he brought forward yesterday, what he was scrambling, 
was something he cut two years ago. He cut the Premier's Youth Council. So he just brought back the same council, put in the, the money again, and saying that he's helping the black community. Listen, I don't think Doug Ford intentionally wants to hurt the black community. I don't think that's the way he is. But he doesn't understand that these types of investments that are, you know, that he's been cutting nonstop. He's cut a billion dollars from helping youth in the last two years. A billion dollars has been cut out of, uh, you know, out of uh, youth and children's services in Ontario. Where does that money gone? For tax breaks to the richest Ontarians, to the big corporations. That's how these guys work. And um, he has to start to realize that those cuts have an effect long term. And it not only so, has an effect in the black community, it has an effect in all communities because the black community is then not reaching its full potential. So, Mr. Couture, where hey, is... Hey, call me Michael. Call me Michael, oh, please. All right, Michael. Michael, where is the money going for those who have to pay their rent in Jane and Finch, Flemington Park, for those who have to pay their rent in Scarborough, Galloway, Chesterly, across the board? If they're supposed to be helping the black community... This is where they state is black community. Uh, so that's let me, what let me, give you, let me give you a perfect example. So a lot, most, most personal support workers that I've met, well, them, a lot of them, a large percentage are from the Caribbean. Jamaican, you know, my family's from Grenada. Grenada, yep. all this personal support where they go into the homes and they help people who are sick, the aging, right. people who need help, right. people with disabilities. So they're more prone to being sick because they're around a lot of, you know, people who may be sick, right? They're you know, putting their so lives it's like, a, it's like a teacher with, with, uh, with a kid, right? They're, right. they're going to get more exposure to, you know, to viruses and colds. So he today said he doesn't believe in providing sick days. Like, this is what Doug Ford said today. Now, think about that. Imagine you have a family and you get sick because you're helping people. You know, you're, uh, you're a personal support worker. In Doug Ford's Ontario, he won't provide those sick days. So that's just a simple, exam a simple example. But there's, um, when it comes to OSAP, for example, he cut free tuition, we had a free tuition program. Do you know who the number one recipients of those programs were? Black women and indigenous people. The number one gains in, uh, in post-secondary from free tuition. Doug Ford cut those pieces. So I don't want to get into this, uh, you know, this whole thing about Doug Ford did this, 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 this. All I'm saying is that if you want to make a decision about policy, about what you invest in, what you don't invest in, you've just got to look at the data. You've got to look at the science. And I'll tell you, if you make those investments into recreation, our after school program, recreational program, skills development, you actually end up making more money because chances are those young people are going to get into better jobs, pay more taxes, and you save money. You know, in, in the Jane and Finch community right now, do you, know how much, do you know how much is spent on policing and incarceration right now? $80 million a year. Yeah. Think about that. Which is absolutely insane to me, but, you Take know. 10% what of that invested in the, in, the, in the preventative stuff. Let's see what that number looks like five years from now. You know... Michael, you talk about especially the Jane and Finch community because that's a community that grew me. I raised, I was raised oh, through the Oh, okay. I didn't know that community. was your neighborhood. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I love it dearly and I respect it dearly. Uh, I'm going to ask you, and maybe I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm, we're from the outside looking in, but do you think there's a racial divide in this city, even in the political scene, that everyday patrons we don't see? There is a, a racial divide in this city, and it, I would say it's more of a economic divide. But unfortunately, within that economic divide, there's more racialized people on the one side. You know, so it is it is come down to cash, who has access to the jobs, who are on the boards, who's in elected positions, who is serving in the Fortune 500 companies. And that divide is is an economic divide. And when you start to look at the, the, the divide a little bit closer, you'll see that there's a, a real correlation between race, the, the, the racialized people and, and, and poverty. And when you see that, you, it does become a, a racial issue, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember when I was a uh, school board trustee, I read a statistic and it shocked me that if you're a young black man who graduates university, 
um, you know, the, the uh, unemployment rate was like 27% for, imagine, mm -hmm. a black guy who goes to university and, you know, graduates trying to get a job, 27% unemployment rate. If you're a white kid who doesn't even graduate high school, it's around 10%. So it says a lot about, you know, even, even when you try your hardest and you push and you, you know, you commit yourself, there's still those big challenges in front of us. And uh, until, you know, that frustration we're seeing around the world right now, you know, with the, the protests that are happening, you know, all over this country, it's a reflection of not only the police brutality, it's a reflection of the frustration people have in everyday life, people who are working and putting in their dues and not getting rewarded for it. People would, just want to work be, hard and make and, and make it. Would you agree we might have the same problem here in our beautiful city that our enforcement have situations where racial tension is at the highest peak? Well, there's no question. The there's youth? no question. Um, you know, did you see that video from, from last year of that kid in Durham? Did you see that video? Of course. Of course, one hundred percent. Where the knees are knees everywhere. So here's the crazy what? thing about that situation. Do you know that I read that the the authority that made a ruling on that deemed it legal to for the police officer to do that. But but in the RCMP, you can't do that. It's an illegal process in Manitoba. I think it was Manitoba actually. Even where we saw, you know, what happened in the States, that cop legally in that state didn't have the authority to, to use that, that, that type of um, uh, technique. But it's legal in Ontario. So there you go. Um, you know, you, you grew up in Jane and Finch. I grew up in Flamel. You have 100 stories. I have 100 stories. We know, you know, if you live in those neighborhoods, you know the stories. You know, you've seen it firsthand. And, you know... It happens, you know, it happens every single day to black men and they're targeted in, in cities. Now, that's not saying all police officers are, are bad. Um, no. That's just saying that it happens to such a degree that it actually has such a, a high impact on, if you ask any black, if you ask any black man in this city, has he been harassed by a police officer? And I, I would say, I would guess that my guess would be at least 80% would say yes. Yeah. What, what would but you say? What, what would you say? I would say 95. There you go. But the government knows this. You are part of a powerful government. I love my country. I love, I'm born in Ottawa. But what okay, is nice. being done? What is being done? This is the point that gets me. You know. I know, we sit here, we have this conversation, we talk about it, but what is being done? What is the changes? We see police brutality daily sometimes, daily. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's more about the news of talking about garbage and, you know, squirrel in a tree more than what's happening to our regular everyday people. So we're, and we reach out, we call MPPs, we call you know, council women or council men. Nothing right. changes. Michael, there needs yeah. to be a change. There so has there, to be a change. So here, here's the thing. So you, do you remember, you remember Justice Tullock went around Ontario a, two years ago, three years ago. And I know did, the name. Uh, he did a report. So uh, Justice Tullock, Michael Tullock, uh, Judge uh, here in uh, in Toronto, one, I think the first judge, first black judge to sit on the Ontario High Court, I think that's his uh, his claim to fame. He went out there and did the most extensive consultation on police reform. So he made recommendations like you should collect data, like statistics on who's being arrested, you know that kind of stuff. Um, he talked about tra police training. He talked about oversight, like SEIU. You can't have police investigating police so there were all these recommendations about a hundred recommendations doug ford so even even here's a perfect one you know if a police officer we saw what happened down south if a police officer did that here in ontario 
and they were charged, they would still get paid uh, throughout the rest of their, you know, throughout the investigation, which could take you know, years and years and years. Um, so he made all these recommendations to, to make these changes. When Doug Ford came in, Doug Ford parked everything. So those changes were, uh, those changes were, uh, uh, that act was approved by a previous government and uh, they made changes uh, to, uh, to, that, uh, uh, to that actual bill. And uh, now they're saying they're reviewing the review, which is an old you know, technique that politicians will use to say we're just parking it, right? So, but here's, but here's, the th here's the thing, right? What we're seeing now, like when we talk about politics in general, politics in general, you know, less than 1% of Canadians are affiliated with a political party, less than 1%. When you look into the black community, that percentage is so low. I, we don't I, get out of the I know, I know we have a distaste, like as a community, there's a big distaste to politics because politics has just treated black people, you know, they, 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 they've taken them for granted. They haven't delivered the goods and people have tried, but we can't give up. You know, we don't what is, um, you know, Michael, we, we, don't we, have to, we have to be involved in this process. Like Mitzi Hunter and I just ran for the leadership of the Ontario Liberal Party. Yes. You know, there were, you know, we did not see any ground movement. Like there were a lot of people from the black community that helped us out. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, in regards to the general public, you know, we didn't see a ground swelling of support to come out and, uh, and make changes. I'll tell you this right now. If every single black kid under, under 16, between 14 and 16 showed up to vote uh, in the Ontario leadership, Mitzi Hunter would have been premier of this province one day. But M Michael, I don't mean to, to, to counteract you, but I have to. I don't believe that Mitzi love her to death, love her, respect her, love her energy. But I don't believe you said an important word, groundwork. I don't believe you connected with the people on the ground, the people that right. you need, the people that want to hear what you have to say, but you didn't talk to them. You, like... A lot of politicians talk to, they go to CP, they go to whatever, BBC or, or, or the top news radio station. But we're here. We're not watching that. We're, well, we're here. That's, that, that's, 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 not, that's not really a fair statement. Like, just the fact, like, think about what we're doing right now. You know, I'm this on Z98.7 all the time. I'm, you know, interviewed by Cher, the Caribbean camera, Pride. You know, mm. I go to, uh, you know, uh, uh, I unleashed like uh, my policy documents and, and strategies at like Tropicana Community Services, which, you know, you know, is one of the only, uh, you know, Caribbean serving agencies. Like we do a lot of this stuff. It's nonstop, like nonstop. So, you know, I go to churches, I speak at churches, you know, black churches, like Mitzi's doing the same thing. So I don't know if I, if I would accept that as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a true statement. Maybe uh, we could, maybe, maybe you could do things differently. So don't get me wrong. Maybe you could do things okay. differently and maybe you could, you know, change the approach. But, you know, there's, uh, I think Mitzi, myself, uh, you know, and, um, you know, the very few politicians that have been uh, elected in Ontario from Alvin Curling to Marianne Chambers to Gina Augustine, like people have done a lot of work in the community to, you know, to build the, those relationships. And, you know, even if you look at the policy that, you know, I was I was 30 years old, 29 years old when I was elected to the Toronto District School Board. You know, I brought forward a, uh, you know, the collection of race based data, you know, where people yeah. were calling me a racist in this city, you know, um, when I was in my early 30s, you know, so, you know, like those types of things, you know. So let, let we, me, we've, let been, me we've, been, we've been trying, but I think we also need we also need leadership, non political leadership within the community to help foster those relationships as well. Yes, yes. That is a step that I think you need to do very you at, well. You look at the South Asian communities, the Pakistani community, the Sikh community, you know, the Muslim community, the Chinese community. You know, the, my counterparts from those communities can raise hundreds of thousands of dollars overnight. They can and, and, you know, sign up tens of thousands of people overnight. Um, they have, you know, they have, um, uh, something within the culture that, you know, uh, you know, they, they've seen back home what, you know, not being involved in politics looks like.
and what can happen, you know, and they're, they're very much involved. Uh, but I think, um, I think that, I think as a community, we can, we can do a lot more um, to, you know, to ensure that we get the right type of people into, uh, into, uh, into these positions of leadership. Let me tell you one thing, just uh, like, just so I can explain something to you. Yeah. The Ontario Liberal Party, the Conservative Party, the NDP, the person who becomes the leader of that party needs probably 15 to 20,000 people to sign up and vote for them, for them to become the leader. So think about that one step. If you had 20, if you had 20,000 people across Ontario show up on one day for two hours to vote within a two hour frame to vote, they could choose who the next leader of any of those parties are. Think about that for a second. And, th and those, th they would be the only choices during the next general election. That's the way the party system works. It's so, not impossible. You know what? If, if, you could, if you could motivate 20,000 people in this province, you could actually take over a political party. And I, saw, I saw you, I, you look like you're thinking there for a second. Uh, well, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not impossible. It's incredible. It's not impossible. It's, it's not, not impossible. impossible. It is possible if, look at the position you're in, which is a position I respect, which I think you've worked hard for it. You deserve the position you're in. I'm all just right. saying, we all need to help each other, not even just because of, of, of black skin color, but because of what we need to motivate others, to help others down the road. The reason I'm upset, and I'm very upset from a perspective of I was always liberal right, my whole right, life. Right. But the right. key word was I'm yeah, conflicted yeah. now. So what, so, so what are you now? I'm, I, I don't know. Let me I, ask you I, a I'm question. You were liberal. Have you ever had a, did you ever have a membership in the Ontario Liberal Party? A membership? As yeah. No, I did not have a membership. So that's interesting, you know. So being a liberal is one thing. And, then, and, and this goes to NDP or conservative. But once you sign up to be a member of the Ontario Liberal Party, you get to vote on the policy. You get to vote on who the executive is. You get to vote on the leadership. You get to vote mm -hmm. on the local person who's going to run as the candidate. You've got like J July 1st of this year, the membership to the Ontario Liberal Party is going to be free. Federally, with Justin Trudeau, it's free. So there's no excuse. Because 20 bucks with a family of four could be a lot of money. That could be, you know, that could be groceries for the week, right? Like 80 bucks, some, yeah. right? That's a lot of money. But I mean, we have no excuse. Like when it comes to political uh, influence, you, anyone can sign up. And anyone who's listening, Anyone who listens to this afterwards, July 1st, sign up to be an Ontario Liberal Party member. If you believe in liberal values, if you're, you know, if you're black and you're conservative, sign up to be a conservative member. Sign up to be a Green Party member, an NDP, or I don't care which party you join. I just want you to be part of that voice and do not allow people to speak on your behalf. And then, and then you know, and then complain that, you know, no one's speaking on your behalf. Because well, you've released, the, you've released, you've released your power to people. That's all. That's all politics is: consolidation of power. Well, you you know, you've said it yourself. You've said it yourself, African Canadians. We don't really trust political government. We don't really trust them. Um, right. We don't think our some people. We vote. We vote. We vote. And when we don't get the way, it's like our vote doesn't matter. And even if we do put the person in, they switch. After yeah. a while, they... <laughs> it's so it's po politics. It's so, politics, and you so, know but, this. But, you, but you're you're a hundred percent right. So let me. I always think about it from this perspective. Why would a black kid go vote? Think about that for a second. I always think about this, right? Mm -hmm. More chances of being like you know uh, of being uh, murdered. Less likely to graduate high school and go to post secondary probably, you know, more chances of facing uh, poverty, you know, you're living in a society that where systemic racism exists. Like, why would you support a system that doesn't support you? That's really the, the point, right? That's but, where we go. And I understand that. I completely understand don't, that. Bro. And I have these debates with the guys in my neighborhood all the time. Like, all the time we're having these debates. You know, you know they'll say, that, you know, 
Why would I, you know, be part of the, like the, the, the Babylon system? Like, why would I deal with them kind of things, right? Like, and I understand that kind of stuff, right? I understand right. those things. I grew up with hip hop, man. It made like, in my mind, growing up on like, you know, listening to Karis One, Public Enemy, that's my generation. Like listening to that, yeah. Boogie Down yeah. Production, like my mind has been trained not to trust that, you know, to not to trust government. Here I am in government. So you think about I'm that. But I know, I know when you actually get out there and you actually get involved in the political process and you actually have influence. I've seen it. Like I talked to Donna Harrell yesterday. You know, yeah. she's, uh, you know, Donna? I, you know I, I, don't know her she, I don't know her personally, but I know she's her. She's an incredible woman. Her, her, my first experience with uh, people from the black community who were advocates of the Toronto District School Board, Donna Harrell and uh, Angela Wilson. They came to the school board and they they pushed for the Afrocentric school, and they spent a year doing it. And yeah. this year or last year, this year is the tenth anniversary of the Afrocentric school. They've always got a hundred percent, hundred percent post secondary graduation, like entry into post secondary. Yeah. So they've done well. They've done that well was from two women getting involved in the political process. Two, right? Not a hundred and fifty. That was two women who came to the school board and did not allow the school board to dictate what kind of direction their children's education would go in. You know, okay. and, and, yeah. and it was, that was massive. You, you can make a difference. Let me just, let me say one more thing. I know I'm talking a little too much right now, but I have to tell you this, okay. I go to schools, I go to schools and, I, and I talk to students all the time. It's my favorite thing to do. I love okay. talking to kids. And I tell kids about like, wh where did our system come from? You know, imagine that, you know, about a thousand years ago with the creation of the Magna Carta, this document, the king was, had absolute rule and the people started to protest. They came with their pitchforks and they wanted, you know, they wanted to kill the, the king, right? The king, so the yeah. king says, holy smokes, what's going on here? I got I to gotta switch things up. So he sets up the system that we have, you know, this parliamentary system and says, everyone send a representative to London and we'll vote on things. Like, and the, the reason they called it riding, because apparently that was the distance a horse could travel over the course of a day. So those people in that community, let's just say Jane and Finch say, okay, you know what? We're gonna send, uh, we're gonna send Michael to represent us. They go down to sit with the king, the king's in the thing, you know, and the, and the people from all across the land are, are talking. That's our system that we have. It's not our system, that's the system that we have that we've been you know, that we've inherited as Canadians. We inherited that now, system. Yeah. Every single thing in our life, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter. You pick a chair, a cell phone, a street light, a road, a book, anything you name. You can pick anything. And I ask kids this all the time. Pick something. They say a book. I say, I bet you I can tell you 20 things about that book where governments kind of intervened. You know, the ISBN number at the back, the taxes, where it's imported to, how the book gets into the school. Like, you can go on and on, what kind of material is being used, where it's being shipped by. That's all politics. Every single thing around you is a political decision. So my question is, if you know that, why are you letting people make thousands? If you make a thousand decisions in one day, the politics mm -hmm. around you have made 10,000 decisions to guide you through your decision-making process every single day. So that's why we need to pay attention and we need to be involved and we need to go into parties and we actually need to voice our concerns. Anyone who's listening, anyone who's interested in politics, and like I said, I don't care which party you join. Obviously, I'd like you to join the Ontario Liberal Party, but I don't really care what party you join. If you're interested, send me a message and I, you know, I'll tell you how to access you know, those parties, but we need to be more involved. I, I, I think even as much as involved, we need to be more involved together. Exactly. Um, that, that, is, that is more powerful, I think, than a lot of things that are going on. And I mean, I'm, I'm kind of hurt because I expected uh, it's either you or Mitzi to be our leader. I expected that. Right. Uh, I'm disappointed at, at that thing. I was there. Uh, I saw, you know, I, I talked to Mitzi. Uh, in the Good. station, she came up to Vibe 105. Uh, nice. But then, after trying to get through to her, to when she was doing the push, she got terribly busy. 
I'm gonna you use know, these, that. These these are these are very like these are complicated half a million dollar one year commitment. Every single part of the province, like yeah. you know, these are like there. It's a big machine that builds up. Right. Um, my point is that you know, there's so many people to meet. And you're trying to sell memberships to convince people to come out and support you. Yeah. There, it, it is, it's not like running for in a campaign and trying to convince a person at the door to vote for you. It's asking you to depart with $20 of your money and show up one day and actually, you know, choose me. That's a very different exercise. So you've got to be very specific on how you organize your, 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 your approach. So, um, I'm sure that if you invite Mitzi anytime to come on to the show, that she, you know, would love to. And she does lots of media and works she, really she hard. Does. She's she's yeah. really she's a hard worker, very yeah. very hard and, and dedicated. I'm proud of her. You know, like think about it. The Ontario Liberal Party had uh, six people run for the leadership of their party. Two of them were black. That's the first time in the history. That's history. That was I was going to tell you. That's history. Yeah, I history that. But yeah. my disappointment is the gentleman who, or who we have now, I don't, I don't feel connected. Right. I don't, I don't feel understood by who our leadership is now. Well, and that's a problem. Invite, you should invite him onto the show. He's a nice guy and he believes in liberal values. So if you, you know, can make that happen, I, I'm going to ask you to help me make okay. that happen. Cons consider I'm ask it done. You to consider help it me. done. I All right. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. Feels great. But you know what? You, let me say one thing. What you're yeah. doing, what you're doing is so important. And what you're doing, like to because you branched out, like you're you're pulling in a whole new audience. Like you you say the young audience, you know, I'm yeah. sure, you know, black, but also like multicultural, you know, multicultural. there's a little bit of an urban edge to it, which is a little, you know, different from the stuffy, you know, hallways <laughs> of traditional media. So yeah. like what you're doing is like amazing. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I thank you. And and listen, I know you're busy. I, I've even overextended my time with you. And because I know how hard you work, I know how hard Mitzi works. Uh, I believe in our liberals. Uh, I've talked to Andrea Horvath. She was here, of course. You you probably know that. And Jill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she, I how mean. How did she do? Did she do a good job? I think so. Okay, I good, honestly good, do. Good. Uh, I yeah. think. You know, she did. Uh, she had me thinking, should I have been NDP? Like, that's where I'm at. <laughs> well, you know but what? Like, let's be but honest. But honestly, like, this, I've been this, liberal. Yeah. I've been liberal. I love liberal. Uh, you know, but now, because of what happened before, I'm not going to try and make it detour me now, but I, I'm still up in the air. But I, you've broken that ice for me, and I appreciate that, too actually see a liberal reach out back to their community and really speak to us as you're speaking to us down to earth not in the right. political lights and and stuff like that and i think that's important that's very yeah, important yeah yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? it's politics um, man it's politics it's politics, politics is uh it's what did trick what did politics what did karis once said um Harris once said they write the constitution, the emancipation proclamation, they fight inflation. inflation, but the president's still on vacation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Couto. Listen, <laughs> let me tell you, let me just get one last question in here before you, you hit us. What's your what's your future see for us coming out of this COVID nineteen? I think um, I think the world will change. I think there's a massive opportunity uh, for uh, communities that don't traditionally get to play in the economic uh, environment. You know, when yeah. you see all these, these, these big stores shut down, department stores and restaurants, well, what does that mean for us? You know, that means that, you know, there's opportunity that opens up. I'm not saying it's a good thing that those places shut down. I'm just saying that there's gonna be a need for other types of services in the restaurant sector, for example, you know, people are not going to traditionally go and sit down in a restaurant and just eat anymore. They're going to want the food to either pick it up or get it delivered. Well, what does that mean for, you know, someone who may be listening? Well, does yeah. that mean you can figure out like, you know, how to set up a delivery system? You know, my brother right now is, uh, 
you know, is exploring how to like, you know, do food delivery. He, he loves it. He's passionate about it. He's a welder, right? But he loves mm. food. That's what he was being trained to do, to, you know, to be a chef. He loves food, like making food and, and sharing it. So, I mean, we need to think about that differently. You think about some businesses that are going to be disrupted because of this. Then the question is, well, how could we fill in the service to still have the economy continue to grow? You know, what can we do differently? And I think that's where the opportunity, especially with artificial intelligence, with automation, you know, with quantum computing and all these big changes that are happening, even the way we spend money, like people are, I'll tell you, I, have you been spending cash or you've just been doing everything digitally? A, like, lot, of, a lot of places, I, I still spend a little bit of cash, but a lot of places are not accepting the cash. Yeah, it's all think about that, just debit. one yeah. simple thing. So, so one, once in a while, like, just take a moment to think about the world around you and what's changed. You know, do you, have you heard of um, uh, the, uh, the Gangster Gardener? No, no. Okay, you got, please watch that TED Talk. There's a guy okay. in South Central Los Angeles, and he talks about food security. He okay. talks about, like, if you want sovereignty for yourself, you've got to yeah. own your food. He... That guy's story, if you could ever get that guy on your show, I'm telling you, it would be the best person you'd have for, for five years. He talks okay. about how, you know, how people in communities like, you know, your community that you grew up in, my community that I grew up, we've got to start growing our own food. That's, yeah. you know, that's, and, and once you can do that, I'll tell you this right now, you start to control the world around you. And um, that's another opportunity. You know what? You don't, and you don't have to have a big backyard to grow food. You can do it on your balcony. You can you yeah. could grow anywhere on, in a window. Just grow one thing. And you will see the beauty of what God's given us and the sovereignty that you have inside of you. Kids don't even know that one pepper seed. You could take a scotch bonnet pepper, produce, what, 100 seeds from that? Mm -hmm. That oh, yeah. one pepper plant, can produce in days. one in one summer. You could actually you could actually you could actually create a uh, hundred plants that will bear 30, 30 peppers. So what is that? Three three thousand? No, what is that? Thirty thousand thirty thousand peppers from that one. Yeah. People don't think about that stuff, and it's free. Anyway, Listen, uh, th there's so much more I want to ask you, but I know I'm cut for hey, time. But time, man. Hey, listen, I, you link I, up. I Get me I hope anytime. we can do this again. Yeah. Anytime you want. I, I hope you, we can do this want, again. One day, if you want to talk about uh, food sovereignty, I would love to talk about that, about what we can do to control our world. Let's do it. Let's set okay. it up. I'll set it up with Andrew, your people, and, and we'll get it. We'll get it thing. I, I hope you appreciated being here because I appreciated, appreciated you being here today. Well, and um, I like your backdrop. I see the Canadian flag. <laughs> Next time, I'm going to have the Ontario flag behind me. Yeah, okay, okay. But okay. you see the Jamaica. You see the Jamaica right there. Right? <laughs> nice. Okay, Listen. so I'm going to have to have my Grenadian flag too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 100. So I know, 100. I know Jamaicans outnumber us. Like, what, 250,000 Jamaicans in this city? Or, I know you guys outnumber us. But we're still there. The Grenadians are still there, man. We're working together. We're working together. Listen, Michael, <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate okay, you, hey, man. Peace.